Okay, so this is the third webinar in our Cyberplace series. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Martin Stone, and I'm one of the partners in the Cyber and Data team at Brodies. In, in the first webinar we did in the series uh, back in, I think, the end of September, we were joined by Mo Keir at the Scottish Business Resilience Centre um, to talk about preparedness. And then last month we had Vanessa Cathy, um, who is one of the VPs for cyber at Insurance Broker Lockton to talk about current trends in cyber insurance market and the key considerations when obtaining cyber insurance. If you missed either of those sessions, um, then you can catch up with them on the Brodie's website or on our YouTube channel. Um, and we'll also share links to that after today's event. So today, what we're gonna do is um, move on from we talked about preparedness and uh, cyber insurance to actually go to the heart of a, a cyber incident. And today we're gonna to focus on cyber incident response. So I'm delighted that we've joined by Federico Chirovsky and Mark Cunningham Dickey from Quorum Cyber, a uh, cybersecurity consultancy. Federico is the founder and CEO of Quorum and has 20 years experience in cybersecurity. And Mark is head of incident response and also helps organizations to develop their cyber incident response plans and playbooks. Um, so this should be a really good session uh, for those of you who perhaps haven't been through a cyber incident um, or have done and, and are looking for learnings in terms of what you can maybe do better the next time. So the, the format for today, uh, Federico and Mark can take you through a mock exercise, mock incident, and then talk about what to do, uh, what not to do, um, and steps you can uh, take to help you be better prepared uh, the next time. And as I say, there'll be as usual time at the end uh, for some questions. So please do um, send them through, use the Q&A function on Zoom um, and we'll pick them up and uh, deal with them uh, after the, the presentation. So uh, over to you, uh, Federico and Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to meet you all and thanks for coming. Uh, the idea for today's session was to frame it around almost like a scenario case study. Because uh, I think a lot of people get what they think is a cybersecurity incident from the media, from what they read. And I think it, it does feel very different when you're going through it yourself. And I think sharing and empathizing a little bit with that situation is an important part of being prepared for an incident so that you can react better, respond better. But I also think that it's, there's many types of organizations that have publicly gone through incidents, right? So we've had very public, public sector breaches, for example, what happened to the Irish Health Executive recently or SIPA in Scotland, more historically the NHS with WannaCry. And, and we only get to see those massive ones but sometimes we lose sight that this affects every side of the industry from huge public sector organizations all the way down to public sector to the smaller SMEs. And there's a statistic that I think is back to 2019 really worried me when it was first published. 60% of the SMEs that get hit by a cyber attack go under within the first four to five months after the cyber attack. And that's due to a collection of features, but that's 60%. So as we, as an industry, start developing better resilience and we start mainly the organizations that are funded to do so, like hopefully public sector or the bigger kind of tier one organizations, and attackers start to shift their attention to the more unprepared side of the market that is available to them, their target market. The, the impact that that will have in global economy is enormous if that 60% continues to materialize. So that's why we were excited really today to start this session on what are the do's and don'ts around incident response? Uh, in this team, we deal with incidents of any size and from every type of motivation that you can imagine, from nation state, quite advanced type espionage stuff to the more traditional financially motivated attacks to the very disruptive nature of the, of the other attacks. So we've been, and we are constantly involved in, in quite high pressure rooms that are going through these situations. And we've collected a number of very simple, but important lessons both on things you should do and things you shouldn't do. So today's session is aimed at trying to tell that through a bit of storytelling, bit of a game, and then hopefully looking forward to some cool questions at the end. So let me set the scene. In this, in this quick uh, five to 10 minute introduction, I'm gonna play the customer. And the scenario really uh, is a very, unfortunately very standard occurrence that we see uh, every day or every week that we come to work at Quorum Cyber. Mark is going to act as Quorum Cyber because well, he works for Quorum Cyber, so that works quite, Quite well for us. So the idea is I'm walking, I'm a customer, I'm walking into my desk in the morning and very bluntly things are not working the way I expect them to. Uh, icons are, are different to what they're normally associated to. 
I got files on the desktop that I'm trying to open, but I can't open. My computer's not really responding to when I'm trying to open the files that I was working on yesterday. There's files that don't recognize the extension, so I start getting weird error messages from, from Windows. And really, what I see that it, that is completely new is a text file, a readme.txt file that I don't remember ever seeing before. When I open it, I get a very scary note the, by what we call a ransomware note, informing me that the company's been taken over by a, a, attack, a hacker group, an attacker group, and they're demanding a payment of a ransom equivalent to 25 million pounds in Bitcoin within the next 24 to 48 to, to 24 to 48 hours. Or not only are they never going to return our data to us, but they're actually also going to make it public. So this is a situation that we talk to customers going through every week. And uh, I can't explain to you how many pennies drop on that one moment when you get that note and you don't know what to do. So let's play role play this a little bit out loud. Mark, I'm coming in, I'm coming, opening my computer, I'm seeing these files, I'm seeing that ransomware note. What happens in 19% of the times? So and not what should happen, what, what, what happens to the mind of the people that are going through that situation? Uh, fear and panic typically is uh, things that take over. And it, it's not just uh, as soon as the word starts to spread as well that this is actually happening. It starts to, it really can consume an entire organization and they so, do become paralyzed. How so, does it normally spread? I mean, not, not technically, but from a point of view of comms. So I'm seeing this in my computer. Does this mean every computer has been affected? Uh, can I no, help not, this? Not necessarily, but but also um, similarly, what what we can, uh, what we have actually seen as well is it's not just the computers that are affected. Suddenly, phone systems will be uh, affected as well. So if you've got a VoIP solution within your organization, then suddenly you can't make phone calls, and that's really scary because suddenly, if you can't email people, if you can't send people Teams messages or or, or, or other chat messages and you can't call them, how do you get the message out as well? So this is this is really, I mean, the, it, it's like with any first aid, it's like with any incident, it, that critical time period is right the way at the very start of it. You know, you, you hear something from emergency services, it's the critical hour, that first one. So my advice, uh, if, if you were contacting me, and, the, and uh, I know this isn't any sales thing, but obviously we do the first hour free, which is exactly why we've got that whole critical thing. My advice is start running the uh, start running your incident response plan. So it may not this may not have gone all the way around your organisation at this time, you know. So from a strategic level, I'd be I'd be hoping that you're able to grade the incident, the severity of it, define the attack. In this case, we know that it's a ransomware one. To find the so, impact, start to learn how how widespread it is. Um, so bringing it back to the scenario, I can't measure impact yet because all I know is that I've been impacted. My my gut reaction is going to be probably call the head of IT or head of security, somebody to say, hey, I've just seen this. Are, are you aware of this? So once we do that call, <clears throat> assuming the phones work, right? But let's, uh, let's say I call them on, on the mobile, for example, uh, and I have them on my mobile, right? Right? You have your first contacts in your mobile. Of course you do. Uh, and I get a hold of them and then they confirm, yeah, no, we know that's going on. We actually are a little bit more concerned. We think we know we're starting to get an understanding of the scope. You move to the next slide and we can talk a little bit about, I thought that it was a red, relatively regionalized problem, but then there's there's more information that starts to appear as the incident goes through. And I'm talking to my now security team that's assembled. First of all, as we start to get an idea what files have been compromised. And, and normally this happens through a couple of means. For example, you get a link to a website where the attacker is actually showing you evidence that they've captured the files. And they disclose 10, 20, 50, 100 files as examples to the type of data that you, they've leaked from your organization. So usually you learn through it because it's hit the dark web and that's where the counter is running. A lot of these hacking teams run their own websites and in their websites they announce who's who's been hacked, who's on the counter, the type of data they have, and you can see the number go down. And trust me, that's a really bad number to see go down because you feel the pressure as, as, as mounting up as the time goes by. So we know that we've lost our financial records. We're a listed company, we're a PLC, and prior to release to the market, our financial records have been leaked, all our staff salaries, and the customer database with our next name, the next, next kin financial records, a whole bunch of personal uh, identifiable information that, that we are entrusted with protecting. So at that point, I'm actually panicking. I really don't know what to do. What's making things worse 
different account managers around the businesses are starting to get calls from our customers saying that they've been contacted by the threat actor group saying, hey, do you know that your service provider has been hacked and that we're demanding a ransom? You could pay us too, and we won't release your data. We'll just release everybody else's data. And this is dynamics that are actually happening today. So not only am I not operational, but I'm also now having to think about how to engage or not engage, or what am I doing about the crisis and PR nightmare. So Mark, again, I know my first reaction would be to start calling everybody and making a big room and, and taking people from the task and putting them in a room because I wanna know, I'm upset. I wanna know where we are and what we should be doing next. Is this the right approach? This is not? Not necessarily calling everyone. So this is really where your incident response plans come in. Um, there's obviously the technical aspects, which uh, I don't think we've got a particularly technical uh, audience today, but from the, from the strategic levels, yes, you want your incident response team. And this would be based on, um, this would be based on the severity that you've identified. So, I mean, the fact that this information has gone out, it's obviously going to be, a, uh, it's obviously going to be a severe one. However, if this is the result of a single device being compromised, it may have less of a severity, less of a wide ranging impact than if it was your entire organization, if everything's out. So it is about running that playbook, understand that, sorry, that incident response plan, understanding the grading, understanding the nature of the attack, the actual impact on it, identify the, um, if it represents a data breach, and this one clearly it does. So you're gonna be notifying your cert team, you're gonna be uh, contacting the police, contacting your cyber insurance company as well because if you've got a cyber insurance company, it may not be, uh, it may be that they are specifying that um, you need to use a certain provider. Or if you've decided that you're gonna, if, that you've decided that you're going to take the principal stance and say that you're not gonna pay, that may not be a decision for you. That may be down to your cyber insurance company because the recovery costs there maybe you know it's cheaper for them to pay the ransom and hopefully get that data back versus actually doing it so it's a careful one there if you we are talked about we talked about the philosophy of paid versus not pay and hopefully it comes back in one of the questions at the end we had it at an earlier event earlier this week it, it, it is a minefield of a conversation and just to, to take the hat off the role play for a second my stance and, and personal as well as forums is usually it's a business decision right we'd love to be in a position where most businesses never have to pay uh, organizations, not just businesses. But the realistic approach is sometimes the trade-off of the common good is to actually get the services back up and running again. So it's 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 all well and good to say, well, a, a, a private company that does non-critical services might be able to afford the downtime and the recovery effort. But if you are, for example, what happened to colonial pipelines in the US when suddenly half of the US was without oil distribution because of a ransomware attack, well, the implications of that uh, long-term impact of not recoverability is a lot more severe and health and safety has to be taken into account. So it, it's a very mind, it's a mindful of a conversation that has to be very educated about the risks and the trade-offs and the impacts. Hopefully most businesses and organizations are having that conversation today so they can define their risk appetite. If you haven't, and you do one thing after this, this, this webinar, probably that's the one to do. If we were in a, in a situation where we're being forced to consider the payment of a ransomware, where do we stand on this and what are the limits of our decision-making? Uh, so that's one to that's one to table out there. I mean, we're going to go through three slides that follow things you shouldn't be doing, things you should be doing, and things at the end that we'd like you to consider more strategically. But is there any particular one in this inject? So when we now learn about the whole volume of data, is there any salient point that you want to make here to anybody as they go through the learning of the magnitude of the impact? What's the most important thing? Um. <laughs> That's a difficult one to drop on me without any. Without no, any come on, think on your feet. You'll be fine. No, uh, but I mean, I mean, it's all right. We've been through a lot of customers that have been through this, and it, for example, my one of the ones that I would have is the comms part, right? So please don't talk to the media until you've known exactly what to communicate. Would yeah, be one of the most important things. What you say will matter. Yeah, that's very important. Certainly the internal communications as well. Certainly the strategic level has a tendency to uh, focus on uh, communications with clients, okay. potentially suppliers as well, but internal communications because they are equally, if not more important. If you put out communications that are not representative of the situation that they are seeing, then that starts to undermine some of the trust in the leadership and things like that. What you will see as well is you'll you'll see WhatsApp groups start to pop up and things like that going, yeah, we're being told this, but really it's not, and it's all this, and it's this terrible. And sooner or later, that will leak to the media, you know. Um, 
we've got a load of lawyers on here. What is it? That's uh, that's like no one's watching, but text an email like saying it like it's going to be read out in court. It's you know, it's it's that aspect. What you do want to do as well is if you do still have communications, if users are able to actually still tell you that there is an IT issue, encourage that. Um, it's not a case. A lot of companies say we are aware that this is happening. Stop telling us. It's it's annoying. What you want is you want that ability because they don't know when you've actually finished containing it or you think you've finished containing it. So if they're still coming in going, I'm actually having access with this with this application or with this area, that's actually a really good mechanism by which you can detect if or how the, uh, the incident is actually spreading and what it's actually impacting. So you can actually develop a larger picture by allowing your users to actually continue with this dedicate awesome. people to the phones to take those calls. And that's, to be honest, that's one of the hidden costs of instant response that people often fail to account for, which is the time and the, the help this like function and support that you need to dedicate to be a you wherever you still have a business as usual, but also then the comms around incidents to the whole of the staff, media, social media management, all that kind of stuff it takes an enormous amount of time and coordination and planning to say the right thing. And I want to add something there, but I also conscious of time and I do want to move to the next slide. So let's do the don'ts first and hopefully I can build this one in back in, in the in the do's. So the reason I wanted us to start with the don'ts first is because we've seen more people cause damage in an instant response by doing things they shouldn't have done than by doing the things they should have done. Right. It's very easy to do the wrong thing, especially in that first critical hour that Mark was mentioning. So we, we'd love to evangelize more and the things not to do almost than in the things you should be doing. We have the benefit of doing both today. So things not to do. And Mark, you take it on and I'll add color after each of So, so knee-jerk reactions are, are one of them. Uh, we had an incident recently where best of intentions, they've gone, this device is compromised and they went and shut it down. Now, if you consider that that's a server, so your, your laptop or something like that may have four gig of memory, for example. By shutting that server down, it actually removes, it destroys anything that was actually running in memory. And that to me is evidence. And you never want to destroy evidence. So you, this, is a, this is a load of solicitors that are on the call. You never want to destroy evidence. So don't shut the damn thing down because that's, that's 16 gig essentially of text, of information that I can look at to understand what's actually going on on that machine. We can isolate it. There's different technical mechanisms by which we can actually do this, but don't shut it down straight off. Always come up with a plan as to how you're actually going to deal with these things. And I love this because I think as we were planning this slide together, we were trying to pick which are the most impactful ones. And I, I can't explain enough how many knee-jerk reactions with the best of intentions, right? Getting everybody to help, getting the managed service providers to help, getting your IT teams, your network teams, everybody's wanting to do the best they can. But by not having a coordinated response where everybody knows exactly what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing, you actually are trampling all over that evidence. As Mark said, you could actually make it much harder for us to contain because now, for example, if you bring an incident response team on site, we can't understand what is malicious activity versus what is benign activity done by your IT teams because a lot of the time the activity looks the same. So actually trying to maintain a pristine environment and probably trying to prevent it from spreading is more important than actually trying to disable that host that's already been affected. So you're right, unlikely to be able to do anything to make it better. You need to kind of bite the bullet and accept that that's happened. But yes, unplanned knee-jerk reactions are incredibly detrimental to the outcome that you're looking for, which is rapid containment and rapid recovery and impact mitigation. Second one. So next up, pay. You know, we've already touched on this. Um, there is the There are various different arguments. I'm sure we'll go into it later, but... Um, if you do pay, firstly, there's no guarantee that you are going to get your data back. Secondly, we've seen that uh, if you do get a key that works, it's very, very slow in recovering things. And thirdly, you're going to go on a sucker's list, which means you're going to be retargeted because they know that you pay. NCSC gave a great example of an organization down south in the UK um, that actually paid the ransomware. They got the data back. They didn't learn the lessons from it. Uh, they didn't fix what was broken, and two months later they were hit again. You know, it's 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 you know it may have been a small value initially to them. It's certainly going to be a higher one the next time, and certainly because the initial one was paid by the uh, by the cyber insurance, I'm pretty sure they're not going to have paid the second one because you've not learned that lesson. 
I saw actually one of the questions that was already posted was what proportion of paid ransoms actually have a successful outcome? For example, the Pfizer unlocked. In, in reality, the business model works, right? So if people weren't giving the data back and weren't unencrypted the data once you've paid, nobody would pay because you can only do that a couple of times until the point where everybody knows that you're never going to get your data back. So you might as well not, not pay. The reality is they have incredibly helpful service desks. They have better service desks than most private companies. They are wanting you to engage with them to pay and to get your service back because that is the business model, that they're there to give your data back. You almost want to say thank you at the end sometimes because they've been so incredibly helpful after they caused the massive mayhem. But I think, as Mark said, there's more considerations there than just does it work. And this is one that I think it was, uh, I want to say the Irish health executive, but I, I, that might be wrong. One of the companies that had been affected recently that got hit and got the ransom week, the ransomware keys back. No, actually, I think it was in fact Colonial. They decided that when they started running the decryptor key provided by the hackers, right? The decrypting routines were taking so long that it was quicker to recover the data from the backups that they weren't sure was going to work than actually trying to unencrypt the data. You can forget that, and I think a lot of particularly senior executives that are non-technical are not aware there's a massive impact of time of unencrypting your data. It's not like you get your key and it's all back up again and you can run your business again. It really takes weeks of unencrypting data to go back to the before state. So it's it's not a magic bullet solution. That's, that's And we can then go into the morals of your finding financial crime and perpetuating the, the crime model, but that's more of a personal one, I guess. Next one. So communicate until you know how and what to communicate. We've already touched on this, but certainly going out and saying we are taking the principal stance of we are not paying this ahead of legal advice and consulting your, your cyber insurance company. It's not a good move, especially if the, you've then got to backtrack and worse if you then found out that you've actually backtracked as well. And there's some really nice uh, examples here, people that have handled really well incidents. So I recommend everybody go check Maersk when they got hit. They're, they're used normally as one of the, the poster childs of how to actually communicate. There's a phrase that we in the industry panic whenever we see it and somebody's going through an incident is, we care about your data deeply. We're aware of cybersecurity. We're doing everything we can. Well, you clearly didn't care enough. So don't tell me now that you care is the feeling that everybody reads when you're putting that out there. So there are very good PR training uh, and we've learned our lessons here. And the management of the PR side of an incident is almost more important than the technical management of the incident themselves. Companies that have an incident but shine on the PR management, their stock goes up after an incident. This is insane. And it's the first time we can see direct market value results of companies that suffered a breach but actually have handled it correctly. We see their stock immediately after that goes up before the price, before the incident, because they are perceived to have handled it maturely versus the ones that do an absolute disaster of that management and their stock obviously goes, goes right down to the bottom. So this has direct business and value impact. And that's the conversations that I think will make the reactions get us more prepared for, for, for the conversations the way that we will need to have them. Just try recovery. This is your favorite one. I know this is your favorite. Yeah, I've done, I've done lessons learned with companies where you, know, you look at the actions that people have carried out. And it, again, this touches on the point earlier of everybody just wants to help. Um, and so they come in and I've looked and, and people have been trying to um, stand up new servers and create new virtual machines or re-enable shares that protection mechanisms have slammed down on because it's detected, uh, it's detected ransomware. And they're trying to re-enable these things and you go, why? You, you actually look at the, the logs and, and wonder, were these accounts actually compromised? Were, the, were these being used by the attackers? Because this is exactly the behavior that we would be expecting them to do. You know, the, They're trying to access the backups, they're trying to stand up new stuff, they're, they're doing X, Y, and Z. So yeah, don't just try to recover. You've got to make sure that you contain first. There's one where um, I can see them going and trying to trying to start recovery exercise, uh, recovery um, processes. And I asked them, you know, why, why did you do this? And they said, by the time I arrived at 7 a.m. in the morning, everything was already gone. And you go, okay, so I can understand that, but how did you know that they were actually out of your environment? How did you know that they still didn't have a level of persistence? Because as soon as you put those backups that were offline back online, that's what they're trying to do. And we know that attackers come back to actually try and get these things. 
there's timelines. I I've seen them. Um, you're probably going to have to help me here, Federico, with the time zone name. Um, but I've looked at uh, I've done timeline analysis, and you can see them. Uh, are Russian attackers. They head off for work at half eight in the morning. Vladis, uh, go on, say. I can remember which one this is. Vladis, Vladivostok. Oh, Vladivostok. Thank you. Time. Yes. And then you see them coming back at half five in the evening. Vladis, 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 Vladivostok. I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, either way, when they come back, they they then reconnect to actually see. What amount of damage have they actually inflicted? Can they now get access to those backups that were previously unavailable to them? So you've got to make sure everything's closed first. Yeah, recovery only has to happen after you've contained. Conscious of time, so let's try ramming yeah. through this. So don't just focus on root cause analysis. This is, or don't, don't try to jump there. It, it's just why, why did it happen? Things like that. Yes, it's really important that you actually understand this, but this can come later. This isn't something that you immediately try to do. Um, you can look for, you, as an incident responder, we always look for what we refer to as patient zero, but um, let's, let's try and contain the incident. Let's actually try and make sure that the impact of it is as little as possible to start with. Um, <laughs> buy toys. <laughs> Um, th this is a common one. Uh, we have gone out and we have bought this because it's shiny new and it's artificial intelligence and it does all of these X, Y, and Zs for us. And the, the ultimate thing is, at the end of the day, if you do the basics brilliantly, not only is that significantly cheaper, in a lot of cases free, because it's part of what you've actually already got, it's a lot more productive. It's, you know, they're going to move to the next person because... It's the looking for the weakest link. The looking for soft targets. If you're making yourself a hard target by doing best practice, you, you're not going to necessarily need these toys. I agreed. And one of my concerns, and the reason we have this one here, is the instant response is a time where a lot of executives make budget available that hadn't been made available before. And we see a lot of quite depredatory behavior by the cybersecurity industry trying to take advantage of that opportunity this is the worst time to introduce new technology. You don't need it. What you need is very specific IR work that could include some tools, but you don't need to buy them. Most IR outfits, not just us, will bring their tools with them and will do the job, contain, and then you can make strategic decisions about how to get better. But please, during an incident, the last thing you need to do is go out and put your checkbook out and buy technology. This is not a technology solution at that stage. Blame. <laughs> blame people, finger point. No one's to blame during these things except for the ransomware groups themselves. It's not somebody internal. Phishing emails are very, can be very specific, can be very sophisticated, can be very believable. It's not just the fact that somebody's gone out and clicked a link or gone to a malicious website. It could be that a that a threat actor has taken over a legitimate website that somebody normally visits. This is called a watering hole attack. These things happen. You've got to understand it. Keep a calm head. Don't blame the intern if you learn anything from SolarWinds. Um, then don't blame the intern. There's a great example of PR going really badly wrong. Um, it's, it's no one's fault. No, I agree. I mean, you need to remember you're a victim and anybody in that circumstance is a victim. And unfortunately, you're, you're going to go through the PR nightmare probably if you're a public-facing company anyway, and that's going to come out a lot. So the last thing we need, especially during an incident, is the temperature in the room rising. What we need is cool heads working together to try to get to an outcome, which brings us straight to the things you should do. So we're going to try to run through these quickly, very conscious of time. And yeah. I think Mark already mentioned this one before. The first one is call your cyber insurance provider. And this is what you should do first, because any action you do after that might void your policy. So if you have a cyber policy, I can't stress enough, the first thing you need to do is pick up the phone and call them. On to the next one. So is that not up? Ask for help? Yeah, go for it. Um, so yeah, reach out, ask for help. As I said earlier, you know, we do the first hour free. During that hour, I, I will give you a ton of stuff. I will give you my incident response plans as to, uh, sorry, my incident response playbooks for your situation. It's not necessarily ransomware. I will give you the best advice that I absolutely can because ultimately I want to put myself out of a job. 
Um, if I, if I, you know, so from a, from a, from an MD perspective, I'm sure Federico hates me for that. But if I can actually get you fixed inside of an hour, that's a great win for me. Um, and to be honest, most incident response firms operate in the same way. So it's not just us. There's a ton of really good people in the community and in the industry that can do great work. And a lot of the times what we see is a very short couple hours engagement at the beginning would have saved or could have saved potentially days and days and days of cost that followed. But because we were shy at asking for help quickly, you're losing that valuable time where you could have done actually really impactful containment very early on. So please reach out to people and ask for help quickly. Um, this one's personal uh, to me as well. So I'll, I'll jump on this one because I quite care about this. A lot of the times we forget that people are affected and at the heart of all of this. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of quick examples. There's somebody that might have clicked on a link. They're feeling dreadfully guilty. There's somebody whose account was compromised and they think that they were part of that and maybe they reused the password and they forgot about it. There's IT teams that forgot about decommissioning all devices that were exposed in the internet that were then exploited and then that led to a compromise. There's the instant response team and the IT team that's been awake for now 72 hours, maybe four days, doing nothing but trying to contain the whole thing. There's school drop-offs and pickups. There's kids that are sick. There's families with COVID. There's weddings. There's anniversaries. Life goes on while an incident happens. And what I see more often than not is companies forget that people need to sleep and eat and need to live their lives. So you cannot forget the human angle. And this includes your customers who might be really stressed and affected by the breach and what's going on. There might be services here that are not provided. We are not dealing with a technology issue. We're dealing with a cultural and people issue. And we need to put the people and the culture at the heart of it. And if you do that right, you can get off the hook on mistakes being made on the technology side. But if you forget that the impact, the first and foremost impact that you need to consider is that of your teams, of your peoples, of your customers, their families, you're going to be in, in a world of pain for that recovery to work well. The best teams we've seen are the ones that buy each other a pizza, send each other to bed, come back the next morning, keep working together, take shifts and take care of each other. Make sure you're putting your arms around your people and your teams as they go through this. <laughs> this is all you. This is all you. You're the police officer. Yeah, please, for the love of God. <laughs> Keep a log of your actions and decisions, why, why things were made. Any post-incident analysis, we always desperately need these. As I was saying before, when I was looking through um, event logs, why did these people actually do these actions? I've got to understand this. and We've, we've got to know, you know, at, at the time, there's a lot of technical actions that are going on for, uh, this doesn't just relate to technical aspects as well but you can see them doing a lot of commands and I need to know, are those commands actually legitimate or is this actually, is the account also breached? Two people can use that same account at the same time. It could be malicious. So I've got to know what was being done when, so I can filter that out to understand better the actual motivations behind things and how they've moved through the organization. From a decisions log perspective as well, from the strategic and operational, it's always good from a lessons learned where you can go, we made this decision because X, Y, and Z, it proved to be wrong, but with the information that we had at the time, it was an absolutely the right call to have made. So these are really key. A cyber incident donor is essential. You can't respond to an incident in a committee. The worst thing you can try to do is use democracy as the model for running an incident. This is not how you handle a crisis. Democracy has many benefits and should apply it as much as you can in many other situations. In the middle of a crisis and an instant response, it's not the time to canvas for opinions in, in a way where we're going to make a decision as a collective. Somebody has to be accountable. Somebody has to be the owner of that incident. Their role is to keep everybody else moving in the right direction so that there's very concise list of actions, very clear way forward. Even if it's wrong, I'd rather somebody was making decisive way forward than paralysis and inaction and just letting an incident materialize because everybody's doing disparate activities. So the first thing you can do, this does not need to be a technical role. This can be anybody that's a good project manager. Project managers great, make great incident owners because it's about the structure and the governance of, okay, who's doing what? When are you gonna report this by? What information is that gonna give us to make the best of informed decision that we can for the next step? This is what we want in an incident coordination. So somebody has to be the single point of contact for that incident and everything goes through them. Yeah, well, just to touch on that as well, I'm very conscious of time. We have seen on a lot of occasions, actually, it, it uh, demoralizes staff. If the if decisions still get 
made and made again. And, you know, the, very often you'll find that somebody made a decision during an incident and everybody was happy with it. And then that decision gets made four times over again. They don't want to be dragged through the same thing and it, it just becomes really repetitive. So and a super quick is, recommendation that I normally use when running an incident search to get in there, don't talk to each other, talk to me. So everybody that is involved in the incident, avoid crosstalk. Nobody should be talking between two people in the incident. Everybody talks to a central point so that I can have a complete picture and then share the relevant piece of information with the right people. If you're all talking in pairs, then I have no visibility of what's being done or what's being learned through the incident response. So everybody talks to me. You don't talk to each other. And focus we talk to death about the focus on containment. Don't recover. Don't try to find patient zero. Just focus on containing. That's all we need to be doing. So how to improve things long term. Oops, sorry, that was my bad for double clicking there. Um, discuss roles and responsibilities in incident management. So these should be in your incident response plans and processes. It, these will be roles that are not common day-to-day -day roles of individuals. So they need, those roles need to be defined within your incident response plan. They need to be aware of them as well. It may be that the person that would typically take that is away or is on annual leave out of the country, uh, involved in a road accident, has a new child, things like that. So you need secondaries in there as well. Somebody should be able to pick up that incident response plan, assume that role and be able to take that on because of the descriptions that are in there and the organizational, uh, organizational structure that's in it. Update cyber incident response processes as well. Um, so you need to make sure that your plans and processes are up to date. I also include within that the uh, recovery priorities and the mechanisms. Your incident response processes as well also depend on the nature of the incident. So we have different playbooks as we refer to them as well. Um, so that that way your, your environment is always changing. So those playbooks need to be updated to reflect that and your incident response plan recovery priorities need to be updated to reflect that as well. Train, 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 train. I love cyber exercises because I run a number of cyber exercises. I come up with them. I've spent a lot of time coming up with gamified cyber exercises to make things fun, enjoyable, exciting, really sort of uh, still a pressure environment, but so that way you are familiar with the processes and what needs to happen during an incident. So these things help people become familiar with the process. Once they're familiar with the process, it's a much more relaxed atmosphere. They know what they're doing. They know what's expected of them. So we talk about muscle memory, and I can't, I can't explain how much that matters. It's so much easier to ask people to embody their role that they, we need them to embody during an incident if it's not the first time. So training is probably the cheapest investment you can do to try to improve the outcomes of an incident. Even if you don't have great processes, even if the rules are not perfectly defined, running through training through your executive team, your management team, whoever it is that you're going to count on on that day is the, probably the quickest and cheapest investment you can do to try to uh, develop the muscle memory a little bit sooner than when you actually need it. So establish partnerships now. You've actually got a good example of this, but yeah, if you've got an incident response partner or if you know who it is through your cyber insurance company, but you've got a great example for this as well, Federico. So uh, in, in which example, sorry. This was a printer one. Yeah, so uh, this is where uh, even the industry, so this is not just about establishing partnerships with instant response companies, as, as Mark was saying, but between each other. For example, I know that the printing companies, the printing, the newspaper printing companies have created a partnership between them where if one is suffering a breach and for whatever reason, the newspaper can be printed in one, the others will pick up the load of that printing job so that as a community, you're all still resilient and delivering services at the end of the day, because it can happen to anyone. And I think here's where it, this is about partnerships as a whole. How can you de-risk your business, your organization by supporting others that might be in exactly the same spot? And some industries have done this a lot better than others. Finance industry has the first Tuesday meetings where they all get together as big banks to discuss what incidents they've been seeing. They share intelligence, they share lessons learned. They are able to then connect the dots when they see little things happening, but it's happening in multiple banks at the same time. They can get more proactive about how to respond to these things. The printing industry did the same about the printing side of things. I think it's important for every organization to look around them and see who can they partner with. 
from an incident response perspective, certainly make sure you have an incident response partner you can pick up the phone and call, but also who other people and organizations around you could help you on a bad day and who could you help on a bad day? Yeah, public sector has also done this with regards to um, uh, emergency services and communications. So uh, it used to be when it was multiple different police forces that if one police force was unable to take calls and another one would pick up the uh, pick up the calls for them and, uh, and deal with it that way as well. Collaborate well, with it. Okay, sorry, that was my... We've done it twice. <laughs> yeah, that was completely my fault. Um, so established partners left of bank, so that would be your incident response partners, things like that. Uh, collaborate with us in your industry. So I guess for takeaways, let me go through these quickly because I want to jump into the questions. Uh, I mean, you can, we'll, we'll make the, the, the slides available so you don't need to take notes or remember any of this. But I think main, the more important, the salient important for me here is, and Mark mentioned at the beginning, two incidents can be completely different criticality. My key wish, if I could wish from a Christmas, a Christmas list perspective is, I don't see enough businesses or organizations that have spent proper time thinking what does a bad day look like? What is our worst outcome for us? And how can that outcome materialize? We call this in our industry threat modeling, right? But it's very important for you to understand as an organization, what are the outcomes you're trying to prevent? Because that can educate an investment, that can educate strategy, that can educate decisions. But if you're just making decisions because of Gardner recommendations or somebody else did it this way, or the vendors showed me a really nice user interface, and you're not modeling for what a really bad day looks like, I think you're missing a trick. And the opportunity to actually do that left of bang is unique. And you're going to wish you could have a time machine to travel back to the time you had that you could have made these proactive decisions, as opposed to having to make them on the hoof when you're going through a severe incident. It's really important to make sure that the artifacts that Mark, Mark mentioned, the incident response plans are up to date, but they also need to be available. You don't want them in the computer that's getting encrypted. And again, you don't want them to be 10 pages long. An incident response that is not written in bullet points and that has more than one page is not an incident response plan. It's something else altogether. It's an evidence for, for uh, it's an evidence piece for audits more than an actually actionable uh, incident response plan. I want simple stuff that anybody can follow in bullet point numbers, and it has to be relatively up to date. And talk to your other partners. There's managed service providers that you're working with already, non-security. They will be key partners and key stakeholders in an incident. Make sure you're talking to them. You have 10 seconds to do one uh, or two, Mark, before we move into questions. Which ones um, do you want to highlight here? Well, for, uh, from these, that's that's way too difficult. The logging one's always important because I'm incident response and I need to check things. Um, I'm very aware that this isn't the technical um, call, though. The crown jewel ones, I think, is probably important. We've obviously seen with a couple of incidents recently um, that they've got really key systems that they weren't actually monitoring. So making sure that they have those, but it's also... Not necessarily a lot of people, when you say crown jewels, they think what brings the most revenue or capital into the organization is what's going to cause the greatest fine as well, uh, mm -hmm. or reputational damage. So um, for me, I think I'll, I'll stick with the uh, I'll stick with the top point. But, you know, in, in all honesty, all of these, especially the comm strategy at the bottom, it's, it's you know, the, all of these are really good. And I really I don't want to pick just the one. So. Take your time to read through them and we can always answer any questions later. Do you want to move to Q&A then? And Martin, if you can come back on screen, I actually wanted to ask you one question because this is something that happens to us all the time when we're doing an incident response. The legal side of things is a very important area of an incident response strategy. And we see that a lot of customers don't know how to best engage with their legal partners or not even how, but when. When do you recommend people should be reaching out to law firms and, and to their legal partners? And how do they engage? What is it that we're asking? Yes, yeah, so, um, thanks, thanks, guys. It was a really, really interesting um, presentation. So on, on that point, I mean, it's, it's similar to the cyber insurers that, and sorry, people like you guys, uh, you want to do that as soon as possible. Um, and th th there's a key reason for that. So um, if you are instructing, um, Cyber insurance, sorry, cyber security experts to conduct um, you know, investigations into what's actually happening. Then, if you do that directly, then there's a risk that that report might be disclosable if you are involved in litigation, um, because it wouldn't necessarily be protected by privilege. If it, it would only apply if it was um, commissioned in prospect of a potential litigation. But if you if you communicate with your lawyer, then generally most things that you communicate with your lawyer about and the advice you get um, will be subject to a much broader uh, privilege. So 
actually engaging with your your legal advisors first um, and then getting them to liaise with uh, the likes of you guys um, is is actually really helpful in terms of protecting that information um, and ensuring you know if if you do it, then enter into litigation or claims that that information is, is hopefully protected from from potential disclosure and uh, I'd also say you know, that I think we have a, a role to play this as well in terms of the, the value we can provide and the guidance and helping to coordinate things um, dealing with insurers as well. Um, it's not something that you would deal with every day, um, but it, it is something where, where we have a role. So again, there, there are several people I think you want to speak to straight away. It's your insurers, your lawyers, um, and your um, cybersecurity consultants and your PR people. Those are the four external key external advisors, but the, we can help us in, in terms of managing managing that role as well. Um, that, that was really, really interesting. I, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points you guys have talked about before going to Q&A and, and just, I suppose, emphasize them. Um, it, just in that point around communications, I, I think, and Federico, we, we, we've seen this on um, instances that we've, we've both been involved in in the past where, you know, sometimes people rush to send uh, communications out to their customers um, and it turns out that actually things aren't as bad as they thought they were or they tell people something a bit too soon and you don't give them the full picture so while there might be a tendency to say something you know as soon as possible and tell them that day you don't need to do that yeah you know, actually wait and see what what's happening don't tell the ICO agree. you know and I, I, so to, to pick up on the ICO yeah. point because this is something I think is still misunderstood years after the data privacy act has been issued the 72 hours don't count until you're absolutely sure that you need to communicate to the ICO the 72 hours don't start when you have an incident or you know of an incident. They only begin to count once you've known that incident has led to a severe enough data privacy impact that you are now in the situation where you will have to disclose. And this difference, this is small nuance, but it's very important because you don't need more pressure. Your focus should be on containment. And even if you're breaching the times, I know that the ICO prefers you to do the right thing than to waste time trying to communicate. Just focus on doing the right thing, the right thing by your people, by your customers, by your staff, and then the rest will come. I, I don't like compliance being used as the driver here. Do the right thing. Compliance follows always. Yeah, and and I absolutely agree with that. I say we, we, we've seen it before. People have rushed to do stuff and then, you know, uh, we get involved and then discovered actually they didn't need to do that or they, they haven't said the news. So instead of actually concentrating on on containment. And similarly, your, your point around evidence and, and decision um, decision logs. Again, it's not just supposed to be evidence for law enforcement um, if, if that happens, but also just in terms of assessing the impact. You know, if it's personal data involved, has it actually been um, accessed or not? If you lose that data, then you don't actually know what's happened. So you're in a much worse, worse position. So from, from my perspective, that's all all really, really good good stuff. Um, and the final point, again, I think you, you talked about the blame point, and it's interesting that the, the NCSC, the National Cybersecurity Centre, talks about organisations as being victims. You know, they, they use that language um, and I think you know we are all in this together and picking up on your point around working with others in your sector you know within the legal sector we saw this a few years ago when um, one of the large multinational law firms um, was hit by cyber attack um, in their, actually their Ukraine office um, and the whole sector got together to help them through that because we're all in, involved in the same transactions you know and you, you help other people you share the information back to them they don't have access to because we all want to get through it. And, and that's what we'd hope everyone does, um, you know, if, if you're in that position at some point. So just uh, picking up, we've got a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Um, you, you mentioned Maersk. Um, have you seen any really good examples of people dealing with incidents well? What, what did they get right? Um, what, what's the, the stuff that you, where you see things going well? Well, yeah, we've seen a number of them. And Maersk is a fascinating example, first of all, because not a lot of people of that size are as open as they have been with the cost of the incident. Uh, several twenties of millions, by the way, if anybody's wanting to know, and that's just a the, million. The, yeah. The, but it's also the how did they operate? Uh, and they had a devastating uh, ransomware attack that put down 80% of their operations. Uh, they were saved by a random server that was in the middle of, I think it was Africa, if I can remember correctly, that had the, the recovery. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so oh, they had uh, to fly no, sorry, Uganda. 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 They had to fly in the server back to the UK for it to be used to recover all the services. It was a fascinating story, so I recommend the read. But what I loved about that one was they had good paper-based processes. What they say saved them was they went back to doing things in pen and paper. And a lot of things couldn't be done in pen and paper, but they still had, and they remembered, and they had processes on, okay, if we had no access to systems, how can we do this? 
And, and that's something that I think we've all lost. We are a cloud only company. I don't know how we would operate with the internet going down for weeks and where we can't access services. And I think a lot of companies are, are probably would do well to remember that technology is dependent on power. Power can go down, especially as it's getting more expensive. And we're seeing quite a lot of power energies fail at the moment. It would be very smart to have contingency plans that don't involve us having access to technology because it might be that you're in that situation and Maersk were a fantastic example for that. And the second one was in that comms piece. They did exactly what everybody would recommend them to do. They communicate what they knew, when they knew it, and they promised an update at any given time and they gave an update at that given time. And all they did was share facts. There was no feelings, there was no, we're doing the best we can at doing, we know you take your security seriously. They just were sharing the data of what they knew and they would commit to regular updates and it was the CEO in the front of them. So there was no marketing spin, there was no PR spin. It was just honest, transparent communications. And I think honest, transparent communications something we're desperate, devastatedly missing. Everybody tries to spin it and make it look good. And that does not help the situation. It doesn't help your trust or the market's trust in your reaction. One, one thing to uh, pick up on that, although you've just said, yes, it was great. The CEO was there and out front. The CEO was absolutely informed on these things and he understood the nature of the issue. If we want to look at a bad example, then you've got the talk talk one. Um, which is largely credited with being one of the reasons for spinning up NCSC because there was definitely that need for SMEs and things like that. Um, so when somebody turns around on camera uh, or on Radio 4, I think it was, and says, you know, when asked the question, was the data encrypted? And they say partly, it's a, being a bit pregnant. You know, it, it's a very binary thing. It's either encrypted or it isn't. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's, various different ways to handle it. And, and there's some really good examples yeah. closer to home as well. SIPA suffered a devastating event. So the environmental agency uh, in Scotland suffered a devastating event in this, I think it was December, uh, literally Christmas day, wasn't it? Christmas Eve, one minute past. Christ Christmas uh, Eve. One minute past. Um, and the, for me, the fascinating thing is it was devastating. They openly said it was devastating, but they were cool headed all the way through. They did very solid, intense response work in what is a nightmare of a situation. You can't ask for better, more mature response. You wish the protections have been working better. You wish that a whole bunch of controls were better, right? But we, we've all got, we're all going to get that day. And it's how you respond to that day that to me determines whether you had a mature thinking organization in there. And, and SIPA had, had the worst outcome with the best people doing the best they could. And I thought, I thought they handled it brilliantly, even though it was a, a really yeah, painful Terry, experience for a lot of people. Terry yeah. handled it fantastically with that. Dr. David Perry was the uh, guy who was the incident owner on that one, who's one of the directors. Absolutely fantastic gentleman, very calm, very cool headed, incredibly intelligent, just understood things. And if he didn't understand them, he went away, asked people so that, that way he could get to a level of understanding or he went away and researched things. So he did understand them. Very intelligent gentleman, very, very calm headed um, and very understanding. Yeah, a lot of, lot of respect and praise for, for Super on that one. I think one of the really interesting things that they did a few weeks ago was they actually published a sort of lessons learned. And it's, for anyone who's not read it, it's an absolutely fascinating document, um, you know, even for organizations to think they are prepared. I think, you know, to, SIPA thought they, they had, you know, they, they were well resourced, they'd done a lot of work, but even they found, you know, going back to your point around how, what do you do when your phone network goes down or your comms platform, how, how do you speak to people? Who, who do you know you know, is the right person to speak to? Um, I think it's the right. 30 or 40 points and it's, it's a document that's really worth having a look at um, I think everyone will will take something from it and um, Mark you, you'd mentioned that. SME. I had input into that <laughs> into one of them. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned SMEs there um, a question we've had I suppose you know a lot of SMEs won't have the internal resource and expertise in this um, but I suppose in some ways that also means they are potentially quite vulnerable here because they you know they may be more uh, uh, more, more exposed do you have any recommendations or tips in terms of how they can get started or how, how they can best approach this? Mark, do you want to take that one? I think it's oh, thanks. Um, so SMEs, yeah, there's, there are a lot of free resources out there, but genuinely don't try and go it alone. Um, there are a number of things, certainly, you know, work through an incident response plan, understand what, uh, as we identified before, understand what your crown jewels are, how are you going to protect them? Are you following best practices, the NCSC backup best practices of 321 of three copies of the data across two locations with one offline. Some of those are online. You know, you've got to look at how these various different mechanisms tie together. 
for how you can recover if it's a worse day. Um, even if they're, if, if they're a small entity that's just a one-person shop, last night I was taking full backups of some of my devices, so that, that way if I needed to rebuild them, I actually have that stuff there. A lot of people will just concentrate on the data. I do full system restores and things like that to make sure that it works as well. So it is a, about making sure that your recovery mechanisms work and that you are familiar with them. As we said, you know, practice, train, understand it. If, if you know these things, you are going to sail through, well, maybe not sail through an incident, but you'll fare significantly better than anybody that hasn't actually done this and is coming to it cold. I think there's, 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 uh, there's a point of empathy here, right? I empathize with small business owners who haven't done the transition to understand that to a certain degree they run a technology organization as well. And this is a journey that I think a lot of small businesses still need to do. Regardless of what your trade is, you act as a technology company by the mere fact that you have websites and emails and payment systems and payroll systems. And, and this means that the cost of doing business has gone up because you can't think of all of those things as commoditized. There's a certain amount of obligation on you as a business owner to understand that you have an obligation to maintain those up to date and secure and actually define a strategy there. And I empathize there because a lot of people haven't really gotten to the point where they understood that that's a critical part of running the business. This is a cost of running the business is to run IT securely. Uh, and, and they will find that out on, on the wrong side of an incident when they realize the investment they should have done over time. So I really, I really do feel sorry because I think we carry this problem where people need to culturally shift to the fact that they, they now run a technology company, whether they like it or not. One, and, one thing that I would say but, jumping onto this is even if you have a managed service provider, it's still your risk. A lot of people yeah. think I have outsourced my IT, I've outsourced my risk. It's not, it's still your risk. We see managed service providers getting hit. Make sure and also, you're, it's, you're accountable. Yeah, yeah. somebody else yeah. might be responsible, but you hold the accountability. And the last piece would be, there's really good organizations there to support. So in Scotland, we have the Scottish Business Resilience Center, the SBRC. They are a great place to go to get a lot of advice for small businesses, and they have really good documentation. The National Cybersecurity Center that you mentioned, Martin, the NCSC, is fantastic. It's one of the best governmental information bodies that they get really pragmatic advice. Try to do the basics right, and you will be better off. They do have small business guides up there. They also have board uh, board education things if you're struggling to get your board on board um, and things like that. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, resources into yes. Well, while we're thinking, and just that point on the managed service provider, I mean, we, we see this quite a lot, um, not just in the context of cyber security, but just business continuity generally. The, the number of times we see small organizations perhaps rely very heavily on a managed service provider to run their IT, to run their website or whatever, business critical things, but actually they they don't have, I suppose, the oversight and the contractual means to manage that. And actually, you know, not, not just for cyber, but generally for any any sort of business interruption that actually they, they are potentially exposed. So it, it is something that should be on any any organization's risk agenda, uh, risk, risk radar. Even that, when we're talking been... to boards, uh, just, just to jump in last one, sorry, Martin which is important when we're talking to more, more formal boards, what we say as one of our training packs is, unfortunately, you're going to get, you need to get a little bit more technical. And when we mean technical, we don't mean technical in that you need to understand the technology, but you need to understand how to hold people account to account. This is where we mean when we need to skill up the boards. I don't need you to understand how Azure works or AWS works or a SOC works, but I need you to understand what questions you need to be asking of the people that should understand how these things work. And boards don't know how to ask those questions. So what we're trying to do is scale up the accountable people so that they know how to hold us technologists to account. Because we've been able to operate in darkness without justifying the budgets and the return for quite a long time. I think that's a dynamic that we really need to change. Yeah, Sorry, I, I, we're about to jump yeah. No, no, I, I, I agree with that. I'm just going to, um, conscious of time, so we, we should uh, wrap up there. But I, I hope uh, you found today really useful. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, and thank you to Federico and, and to Mark for um, their contributions as well. Um, we will share a copy of the recording after the event, um, so you can uh, share it with colleagues if you wish. Um, just a quick reminder that our next um, cyber rights session is on 16th of December, um, and in that one we're going to be focusing on reputation management and um, PR following a cyber incident. And then we also have on the 9th of December, the week before that, um, 
well, privateers are often data protection and GDPR update. We're obviously into December, so it will be a, a slightly more uh, wintry update. Um, but lots and lots to cover in that. Um, a lot has happened over the last six months, so we hope to see you there. Um, details both events are on our website. You can sign up there and we'll also include links in the follow-up email. So I think that, that's all that we want to cover today. Thank you much, uh, very much again to Federico and to Mark for joining us. And if I could just ask you one last favour, um, as, as you leave the Zoom call, you get a prompt to complete a survey. Um, if you could fill that in, we would really appreciate it. It takes you less than a minute. Um, as I, I said in another webinar recently, um, we know it takes not very long at all because um, when we get the results, we see how long it takes people and it genuinely is 20 to 30 seconds. Um, a couple of short questions, if you can fill that in, it really helps us in terms of uh, developing these events and finding out what, what works for you, what uh, you would like to see us cover. Um, we really value that feedback, so please do take, take a moment to do that. And we look forward to seeing you on another event soon. Thank you very much.